talk about content generation at scale. And so Logan, this was an amazing one-two punch because you got to talk about how it works and how we can get one token out. I'm going to talk about how we can get many, many tokens out in a predictable way by using something called retrieval augmented generation, which is a big fancy word for using a database. Um, so how, let's see, how did this start? In about December, um, CEO of this company, I was in ed tech for a long time, CEO of an ed tech called me and said, Ken, do you want to run a project? And I said, no, I don't, I'm done, I don't want to do that. And then hung up, and then after that phone call, I got this like fan of the seat in my head, and I couldn't sleep, I couldn't, I had to get it out. And the thing is, like, we generated, how many lessons? Thousands and thousands of e-learning lessons for students. And we had a process, and we generated all this content, and I'm like, you know, I wonder if, I wonder if an LLM could do just as good as our curriculum writers could. And you know, I didn't really know anything about LLMs. I hadn't been playing a little with it that much. And so I went on a journey and I dove deep. And um, my wife will tell you I worked a lot of Saturdays and Sundays and nights and got up early and it became an obsession for me. You guys know what that's like. So anyway, this is the story. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I was able to tame the AI and get it to do what I wanted it to do at scale. Um, I have some code. I don't know if we'll get to that tonight or not, but if I don't, you can send me something on Slack. I can share a, a repo with kind of a fork of a, maybe not completely working, but you can see the code. And then I'm gonna show you the content that I was able to generate, what it looks like in a kind of e-learning format. So let's jump in. What is retrieval augmented generation? Does anybody know what that is or have a good feeling what it, it is? Oh, great, this is, you're in the right place then. So, ChatGTP, everybody's used it, we all know about it. There's a website, a prompt, I enter a prompt, it runs the prompt, it gives me results, I copy and paste those results into my email, my Word document, and that's the basic use of ChatGTP. And so, for example, I can say, write a good morning Slack message, I can send to everybody in the company, and it'll do that, right? Not very interesting, not very interesting. But um, with retrieval augmented generation, instead of just that prompt, I'm gonna feed it some extra information to go with the prompt to get better result. So I enter the prompt, I go to the database, data source, whatever, pull something in, and now I have an augmented prompt. And I send that augmented prompt to the LLM, and then I get the output. So an example is, get the weather forecast for today, and then, given that forecast, write a good morning Slack. And so now, the LLM has a little bit more context to work with. Instead of just random Slack message, it knows how to provide weather, stock, sports scores, whatever I wanted to do, I can have it pull that information out of the database, augment the prompt, goes to chat GTP, and then I get better output, more relevant output. Make sense? All right. So can we take educational standards and create e-learning for a textbook? If I just go into chat GTP and say, create me a textbook, it's not going to do very good because there's not enough context there. If I say, can you write me an e-learning lesson about um, how to wash hands in a hospital setting it can do a little bit better job. The more context I give it, the more information I feed it, the more tokens it has, the better prediction it can do of the correct output that I'm looking for. And so I build a system where I take the standards, I put them into a database. I read the database, pull something out, generate, here's my list of topics, here's my list of procedures, here's my list of skills, put that back in the database. For each one of those, pull it out of the database and repeat, repeat, repeat. And so that's how I was able to use it to build a system that's going to generate pretty good, I think it's pretty good e-learning content. As I was going through here, I found a couple design patterns. I love design patterns. Um, so I'm just going to go through the design patterns. The patterns I used in my application to get the results. Um, the first one I call analysis. So given the 
given educational standards, analyze this data, and pick out 15 key topics, right? We all done, if you don't know what chat GTP, summarize this, pick out the key topics, tell me what this is about. That's something chat GTP is very good at. And so um, I call that an analysis step. Feed it in the data, run this analysis, get out JSON data, put it back in the database. Next one I call a fan out because I have one document of standards and I need to create maybe 100 lessons. So this is like a for loop. For each one of these 15 topics I picked out from the analysis, run a prompt. So now I'm running 15 prompts. Run one for this particular thing, store it. Run it for the next one, store it. Run it for the next one, store it. Run it for the next one, store it. One, store it. I call the fan out. So we do the analysis, we do the fan out, and then I have a content generation step. So now that I know, um, and these get mixed in, so we might analyze this, give me 15 um, topics. For each topic, create me an outline. For each outline step, you know, produce a page of content. And so we chain these all together. The generation step is going to take something like, for example, generate a page, one page of content that covers this topic, which is a part of this larger topic. And you can see how that one prompt with ChatGTP is going to provide, you know, decent results. The more context you give it, the better results. But when you start chaining these all together into a system, that's when you can really scale up your content generation and create lots and lots of content. And then the last step I have is called an enhance. So once we have content, um, it's usually not quite good enough in the beginning. So I need to enhance that content and create something a little bit better. Um, so the enhance might be, hey, at the end of each lesson, I want a quiz. So take this quiz that you just generated and give me five questions that I can ask the student about that topic so I can know if they're paying attention or not, right? And so um, in practice, um, I take the educational standards, ingest them, put them in a database, and then I create what I call a course. Um, I, from the course, I say, what are the main units of instruction? For each unit of instruction, what are the lessons? For each lesson, what are the content pages? And then what is the quiz that's going to line up with those content pages? Make sense? Any questions with kind of what I'm doing or why I'm doing it or any of that before? I... Yeah. Hallucinations, that's a great question. Um, it's interesting because when I look at this process, when I first started doing this, I wasn't really following any kind of particular process on how to create content. And then I remembered when I worked in e-learning we had a very specific process that we used by humans. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. And if we use this process in a repeatable way, we get predictable output. And so what I tried to do is if I use the same process with the chat GTP that we used with humans by breaking it down into little tiny pieces, it came out pretty good. Um, there were some hallucinations. And for example, um, the quiz. If I say, here's a lesson, create quizzes for it. Sometimes I would get quiz questions that had nothing to do with the lesson. And so in education, sometimes what they tell you to do is to reverse it. Create your assessment first, and then write the content based on the assessment. When I reversed it, I got much better results, because now all the quiz questions were covered by the content, and instead of the other way around, where they might have hallucinated the quiz question didn't mean anything. If I was going to sell this content, I would have a human review it. We're not there yet. So um, when we go back to the ethics, this is still an experiment to see if we can make this work, rather than something that's ready to put in front of humans and trust it. We're not ready to trust it yet. Yeah, um, so there's, there's two things I've thought of there. First of all, 
if I'm using like chat GTP4, can I use Gemini to review it and fact check it? I mean, if I give it a page of content and ask it to fact check it, is it gonna rule out 80% of hallucinations? Maybe. If I ask Luke to review textbook content, he's gonna fall asleep halfway through and he's gonna miss half the problems anyway. So it's also being in ed tech and seeing how the sausage was made before, how many errors we had by even after the subject matter experts and the authors and the reviewers and then you get somebody else to review it and you get a third person to review it and then you send it out and the teacher says, that's wrong on day one. It's like, how'd that happen, right? So anyway, how accurate is the textbook, right? How accurate is the textbook? It's not 100%. Is the textbook 90%? Can I get to 90% with the AI? Or is the AI gonna give me 70% and I need to have a human augment to get the rest of the way? That's a fascinating question. The other thing I thought of is if I did have a human review it, and you'll see when I show you the actual app, there's a section at the bottom of add a correction. So if I build up a database of corrections, can I rerun it? Given all of these corrections and this content that you previously generated, can you fix this for me? And then there's other things too, like um, given this page of content, can you make it a little bit easier for a seventh grader to read? So and incorporate this list of corrections so that you don't go off the deep end. I think it's, there's some interesting things here. Yeah? It's a personal project right now. Maybe it'll be a real project, I don't know. I don't know, anything can happen. What good does a generic book that's not generated by AI do? Well, I'll let you see the content, and um, if you're really interested, I'll give you a link. You can take a look at it a little bit deeper later on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so what the student doesn't read textbook. What we found is the student will read their phone and they'll get their phone out, they can spend five minutes on the bus, I'm good. And then, yeah, maybe. Maybe that's a better way to do it. Um, so on my implementation side, I have a Python CLI that ingests data. I stick it into my favorite database, DynamoDB, because I don't have to do any schemas or planning, I just shove the data in it and it's fine. And then I have a queue that runs. So the queue is gonna look at the database and say, oh, I found some standards. The first step is X, and then it's gonna run X. And then it's gonna run the next step, and it's gonna run the next step. And oh, this lesson doesn't have a quiz. I'm gonna generate a quiz. So I have this queuing system that, um, like a job system in Python, that will read the database, look at the current state, and then kind of figure out what the next step is. That's just regular procedural programming, no AI stuff there. Except I don't know Python, so I did have to use ChatGTP a little bit to <laughs> help me out. Um, so kind of final thoughts, and we talked about some of these already, but um, maybe it would be cool if the teacher had a prompt box where they could say, I like this content, but can you change the examples from New York City to Lancaster so that it's more relevant and interesting for my students, right? Um, can we run it? backwards through the system to verify coverage of the standards. So given these lessons, tell me which standards are covered and which ones you may have missed. Again, how do we prevent hallucinations? Um, and then the, the big thing that I was thinking about for a little while and I didn't do anything about it, is there are ways to generalize this workflow for other things. I wanna create, maybe ethically or maybe not, a thousand blog posts. Here's a Wikipedia article. Create a thousand blog posts from this Wikipedia article. How would you approach that? Could we take these same steps and generalize it so it's not just about textbook, but it can be used for other things? And then what other problem domains might benefit from something like that? So these are kind of on my, my, my thoughts. 
All right, you want to see what it looks like? Yeah. All right, so um, you can't copyright content that's generated by chat GTP, right? What's that? Why not? Because you can only copyright, you can only copyright content created by a human. Well, I created it. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. So. Yeah, he's, he's never read the terms of services. So my, my thought was, you know, what if we open source content and if it does become a real project, we can sell access to the system. We can sell prompts to regenerate it and customize it for you. And what's it even mean to have open source content? You can go through and copy and paste every page and I'm not going to track you down. Well, teachers did that anyway. So I created this site, opencte.org, and you guys can go there if you want now or later, and you can click this little demo button. And um, I have a couple courses in here that I generated. Um, basic healthcare worker, digital information technology, entrepreneurship, health science finance, uh, personal finance, this is entrepreneurship, review content. And then this is my outline for this. I have this unit with those lessons. Um, so 13 units, each unit has about eight lessons, and then I did this with about eight different courses. If I go in here and I want to learn about analyzing cash flow, the lessons are going to look a little bit like this. So this is e-learning content for students. We used to sell stuff very similar to this for lots of money to schools. And um, when I look at it, Jake used to work with me and Alex used to work with me. This probably doesn't look that different than what we did. So. Um, we have some content here. Uh, I added vocabulary words. This is an enhanced step. Go through the lesson, identify vocabulary words. When I click the vocabulary word, it gives me a definition. Um, just because I was playing around a little bit, I did a Spanish translation for all those words in case students are having a hard time learning English. Um, you can go through here. Here's that feedback or corrections that I was playing around with. Yeah, she was my human reviewer. And then at the end, I just do uh, flashcards with all the vocabulary words. This is all just regular program. There's no LLM stuff here. All the LLM stuff is generated and put in the database. So there's no real time generation of content. It's all static content that I'm serving, right? So I have um, flashcards that students can study. And then I have, oops, next page. And then I have my quiz. And the student can take the quiz, and we can assess their knowledge on this topic. Um, it's, it's not bad. It's not bad. It took a long time to kind of tame it, force it into the way I wanted it to work. I did a lot of work on the prompts. It costs some money to like run all those prompts because it's like a fan out system. So it, many, many prompts it's running, many API calls. Um, stick it all in a database, and there it is. Yes? I just want you to kind of make a connection between what the Logan said about ethics for um, and bias and things. It's something that Ken came across when he was using mm -hmm. perhaps names of, you know, a person that was in, in, a, in a lesson, and they were very, like, what was it, like Emma or like. Yeah, like I said, okay, I tried to do it like, at the end of each place and create a case study that illustrates the, a real life example of this. Every case study, every single one had the word Emma. Emma does this, Emma does that. And so you have to tweak the prompts to remove that bias. And so using diverse names that represent a broad variety of cultures create a case study. And so there's a lot of work on the prompts to kind of make it do what you need it to do. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. The bias, it, it has a lot, there's a lot of bias in chat GPT because all it's doing is it's reading these other materials which are biased and it's multiplying that bias. And so if you want to level that out a little bit, you need to adjust the prompts accordingly. Yeah, so that'd be cool. <laughs> like, T tell me who you tell me who you voted for recently. <laughs> I have the perfect content for you. Yes. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. Exactly. Our, it was our biggest customer back in the day. So. Yeah. Uh, of all of your uh, content pages, how many of you started with, as a large language model, I'm not allowed to discuss this stuff? Um, so it, it's interesting because a lot of the times it was doing some weird stuff, like welcome to the exciting world of business. And so, but they, it was kind of all over the place. So I, I leaned into it, as you would probably guess. So start each lesson with the words, welcome to the exciting world of. And let's dive in. So I encouraged it to use some of these words, a little gimmicky, but you know, it, I, I was trying to have some fun with it too. So all, this, all the lessons, if you look at them, um, let's dive in. I don't see that here, but welcome to the exciting world of. But I'm like, that, that's weird. I'm like, no, no, I like that. We can do that for every one, and then we can create a little consistency. The student goes, oh, here we go again. But it's kind of, kind of like adding a little dad joke to it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I did not. I really only focused on first the chat GTP 3.5 and then I used the 4.0. I was really trying to figure out, you know, given all this stuff, how can I build applications on top of it rather than uh, worrying about how the technology itself works. And so like retrieval augmented generation is a big fancy word, it has nothing to do with a model. All we're doing is we're getting data and we're adding it to the prompt to give that prompt more context and then the LLM does the same thing it would any other time it would do. So no, I didn't get into any of the actual, I didn't train the LLM, I didn't go into open source, I didn't run it locally, it was all through the APIs. Yeah. So I played with two things. Um, I tried images and the, the dolly and stuff. A lot of this work was done like December, January, February. And there's newer models now. I, I cannot get it to make consistent images. I have, it has a hard time with diagrams. Like a lot of this is medical content. So I'm sh I want to show body. It, no, it's, it didn't do a good job there. Now, I think some of that has gotten better with more recent models, but I have not, I have not tried it. I would love to. The other thing I did is for some of the business ones, I was trying to figure out if there's a way to automate. Um, so there's certain, like, yeah, there's a supply demand curve. How can we, can we build some of those simulations into this? So we teach supply and demand, and then we give a little slider with, you know, you can play the, change the variables, simulate things, and create that content. So can we create that, oh, I need you to write JavaScript that does this, that I can put into my web page to simulate it, um, but it, it got complicated because now I'm like mixing content and code and I didn't, I didn't go too far down that route. No, it's basically, um, so the prompts are all custom. So I want you to create a lesson. And here are the skills, here are the procedures, here are the topics that you're pulling out of JSON. Yes, it's very prescribed. Yeah, so I, I didn't really want to use like a pre-built rag that's more document-based. I was trying to like, it's all kind of JSON-based, so take this JSON data, mash it up with this prompt, which I've predefined, custom for this particular task of generating vocabulary words. And then give me the JSON and stick it back in the database. So sometimes when you hear RAG, there's um, standard systems that kind of help you do this. This is all just string, string format, 
during interpolation. Yeah. Yeah, you go to Florida Department of Education, you look for standards on home health aid, you copy those, you paste those into, um, just paste them into a text file, and that's where I start with my ingest process. And so, but I, I had to change it a little bit because some states just do weird things like they repeat things and then it, yeah. But anyway, I had to do a little bit of a fix up with the standards documents, which I was a little, I was hoping just to like, grab this, paste it, and go. I did have to do a little bit of manipulation with those, with the ingestion standards. Can I add on to that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, to kind of expand on that a little bit, there are a lot of technologies that will do these sort of rag models and will uh, just kind of connect to your, like, document storage somewhere. So, uh, like, AWS released Amazon Q back in, like, December or whatever, uh, that you can say, like, oh, or my Google Drive, and it'll go through and scan and basically vectorize all of your documents yeah. so that when you do the user prop, right, it'll have, it'll weight those vectors and those tokens and yeah. uh, send the rest of the internet. My experience with those, though, is that, like, at least for the documents that I'm giving them, that most of them are bad. That's like, why, <laughs> that's like part of why I was yeah. Mm -hmm. That product's going to come out someday. They're, they're starting working on it for sure. But right now, like, all those products are kind of stuck. My experience. So th these are the standards, what you might see on a standards document. I do vectorize and store those in um, Postgres. Okay. And more for uh, if the teacher says, I need a lesson on X, can we find a lesson on X? Do we need to generate a lesson on X? If I have the standard in this state, can I reuse that lesson and then just make a couple changes rather than doing the whole workflow? I didn't build any of that, but that was the thought there. And I think there is something there. Like if I can find a lesson that's 99%, 50% the same, I can skip a lot of those earlier generation steps if I want to optimize it and save some money on API calls. Tim. Yeah. No, I was forcing this thing to do exactly what I wanted it to do. I did not, what, what was the, I heard a term, I am not, I am micromanaging this AI. This AI is micromanaged. It is not given any free reign. Yeah. It's my favorite new term, micromanaging. Yeah. So I have a workflow, but it's a defined workflow. Like it knows step one, step two, step three, step four. It looks for the missing thing and fills it in. Um, I, I, I don't know, and I, that, that's a great question. So I, I think really what you're asking is, can we set up parameters where the AI can take this and figure out the steps to create the right result? Is that kind of what you're, where you're going? I think because of the scale of the content I'm creating, um, I, I don't think it can. I don't think it can today. Um, now the the the, con, the token the token windows the token limits on the AI are increasing. So what that means is, um, if I have like a five token limit, I can give it an array like Logan had, and it's going to spit out the right result because I'm only doing five tokens. If I have what are the biggest? What's the Gemini, Luke? How many tokens? million tokens. So with a million tokens, could I take all of those prompts, 
and all of this data, jam them all into one thing and say go and have it come out with the entire book? I, I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah, well, the LL, you can't, you can micromanage it to a certain extent. You can't tell it how to do the work, you can tell it what to do. Yeah. So if we had standards like this, um, the, the APIs are a little bit slow and I don't have any parallelism built in, so it might take like two hours to run and cost you maybe 50 bucks in API calls. So, not bad. If you have if you have something of value, right? Zero. There's no massaging here. I massage the standards, massage the prompts. There's no massaging the actual lesson. <laughs> it's no, just, just run next next call, next call, next call. Run the process. Do the fan out. Each unit, fan out that, each lesson, each page. Yeah. Did you have? Oh, great. Yeah. Yep. No, it may, it actually did not. It just made stuff up. It's pure. <laughs> so wait. It made stuff up that is statistically close to what it should have been. And that's what the LLM does. The LLM predicts what the text, what this kind of, I tell it, I want content like this. It predicts if it's gonna get that content or not. And it gives me a, the best prediction it can. It doesn't scour anything. Yeah, I tell it, generate content at this reading level that covers these topics, that covers this, 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 yeah. It, it, I think I found it fascinating. So kind of go back to your question, I don't, it doesn't scour the internet when it generates content, but when they made the bottle, they read the entire, they sucked the whole internet into the training process. Exactly. But that's all done when the model's trained and then I'm just using that model, I'm not training anything. Okay. That's a great question because um, I, I reached out to some teachers and they're like, oh, that sounds cool. And then they never got back. And I emailed them again and they didn't get back. And um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. For me, the, the most important thing is the learning experience of, okay, now I understand what I can do with these tools. Um, because for me, just going into chat GTP and typing stuff in and copy and pasting, never enough. Like, what can we do to push this to the limit? And um, that's what I learned, and I think I have a better understanding of that now. Um, I don't know, maybe we can release it as open source, put a free trial up, see if I can get some teachers in. If, if there's interest, maybe it'll turn it into something, maybe it won't, I don't know. <laughs> I 
<laughs> yes. So wouldn't that be a cool thing to have the models train on my content because they think it's good content? Um, and then if you think about the, the so this, this seems novel. Oh, this is cool. We can do this thing. Um, what are the LLMs going to do in ChatGTP5, ChatGTP6? There, can I enter something, create a textbook, and it just does it. And so this seems novel now, but at the rate of change with all these technologies, um, I don't know if I would do that. Just because what, you know, what they're doing today is what people really had to work to get done a year ago. And it's just evolving so fast how much, how it can generate the content. I will say, too, that there's a lot of issues right now around machine learning and AI capitalism where it's that exact thing, where they consume the content created by another LLM or another machine like, generator and it distorts it further. And so they're seeing a trend where uh, the data quality is actually, in some cases, going down because we're that exact problem. And that problem's going to get worse, right? Okay, that's a great question. So could we take the assessment data from the quizzes, learn about where students are struggling and where they're not, and regenerate version two using that additional data? The answer is absolutely yes. Because you can take, you just take that, okay, here's the, given these questions, where are students doing well and where are they doing poor? Awesome, put that in a database. Pull it out of the database. All right, given that this information, how would you fix this lesson to improve it for these outcomes. And again, it's one thing to have a teacher do it. They may actually know what they're doing. This is only going to give you a statistical approximation of what it thinks is going to give better. I, I don't know how well that would work, but I think it would, it may be able to expand on some topics and detract from other topics based on if they know the content or not. But yeah, why not? You can just build the, build the prompts in, add another parameter, run it through another uh, refinement step. One last question. All right. No, oh, yeah, go ahead. I am looking, sure, sure. That's, I had a lot of fun with the project, and um, yeah, I, I would definitely be interested in that. So my name's Ken. Um, if opencte.org, you can click the demo link if you want to take a look at it yourself. If you do want to see this code, uh, send me a Slack message. I'm, Happy to share what I have. What's that? Yeah, it's public. Yeah, you can grab it. I don't care. This is not the final version. It doesn't have the whole framework set up, but it'll give you an idea of the prompts. And there's lots of spelling errors and stuff in the prompts. It's very forgiving. So, and I'm not a Python guy, so go easy on the Python criticism. Thank you, everybody.